It's the U.S. Grand Prix in the land of the free. We saw a good race, but the red cars had no base. Congrats to you, Valtteri, the bridesmaid so constantly. You had a good win, but we chucked that in the bin. Since your teammate had won, and the championship was done, first happen was close, but his attitude was gross. Ferrari, a disaster, who can't make it tired? Hello and welcome to the TF1 Show's recap of the United States Grand Prix. I'm your host, Tunis Ferreira, and uh, I think, you know, the United States National Anthem that was performed right before the start of the race was so bad that I think even this introduction would have been an improvement. But uh, in, in, in any case, I digress. I think we just need to firstly congratulate Lewis Hamilton for winning an incredible sixth world championship. He has now cemented himself as one of the absolute greatest drivers of all time and he is in a golden position next year to create more history and emulate Michael Schumacher's seven championships. Now I think today's race performance perfectly illustrated how complete a driver he has become and I think let's start with him when discussing what happened during the race because uh, a drive from fifth to second is always going to be a great one especially with the super talented and closely contested field up front and I think Hamilton used the perfect balance of race pace and tire management to actually maximize his potential race. Now he had a slightly off color qualifying I think it's it's easy to admit that. It was quite close at the top with with Valtteri Bottas taking pole position and Sebastian Vettel and Max Verstappen in second and third less than a second off pole position. Charles Leclerc they've uh, sort of slotted himself in there and then Hamilton coming home in fifth place about two tenths off. Now I think he was pretty adamant afterwards that he would have probably been able to go much quicker but that he made uh, some sort of mistake on his first run and then for some reason in the second run nobody was able to improve. I don't know something happened with the track temperature or something around the track conditions meant that drivers just couldn't really improve on their second qualifying runs but you know despite that you know he was quite negative and quite down after qualifying quite hard on himself and I think probably just the idea of going out or at least winning the championship in a blaze of glory seemed less likely then given he was going to be starting from fifth on the grid so I think that's probably why he was so disappointed that's an obviously the fact that he just didn't do such a good job but you know the next day and we got to the race and he made quick work of the two Ferraris in the opening lap and he was up to third by the end of the, the, the opening lap. And I think that basically put him in the position to challenge for the win. And uh, he had a very nice overtake uh, on Sebastian Vettel around turn 8. Uh, the outside of turn 8, which was a, a nice little bit of racecraft that we sometimes forget Hamilton possesses. Uh, and he make, makes it look so so easy in a way that it, it doesn't seem like such, a, such an impressive overtake. But uh, on second thought, and if you go back and look, it was actually pretty, pretty nice what he, what he was able to do. But in any case, so after lap one, he was running in third, then very much in the contention for the win. And he was uh, closing up on Max Verstappen throughout the opening stint. And uh, yeah, and then I think the first round of pit stops started. And I think uh, surprisingly, I thought that I, well, I was of the opinion that most people would try to do the one stop, given how long the tires lasted in Mexico. 
but actually it seemed like the tires uh, degraded quite a lot more quickly than what the teams anticipated. And when Max Verstappen made his, his pit stop after you know running a couple of laps on the medium tires, I think 14 laps or something like that, um, Bottas followed him in to, to cover the potential undercut, and that meant Hamilton uh, was in the perfect position to to go a bit longer and to see if he if if he can make a one stop work so i think he was probably it was him and daniel ricardo and sergio perez that made a, a one stop work really well and um, hamilton actually gained time relative to bottas over the race distance on and i think it turned out to be the weaker strategy the one stop so i think we can doff our caps to the man of the hour um just for making that strategy work so well for him given that I think he probably, it, it could have been a lot worse for him. I think he he did really well to maintain a reasonable pace and to still somehow keep his tires alive to the end of the race. And as a, his race engineer, Peter Bonington, said over the radio at some point that they're actually not sure whether the tires would be able to make it to the end of the race. So I think Hamilton made the best of a, a not-so-great strategy, it turned out. Um, and... Uh, I guess he was slightly saved from coming in third place by the the double waved yellows that came out when Magnussen's brakes failed right at the end of the race, which meant he was at least able to keep second place. But you know, he came second. It was for Mercedes one to massive, massive celebration for for Hamilton on the podium, and deservedly so. I mean, the six world championships is really, really an impressive achievement. And I think something that ticked me off slightly. You know, when watching the, the the sort of coverage after the race and after now Hamilton officially winning the title was how everybody immediately went to, you know, Hamilton now having to win seven championships and not actually standing still and thinking about the significance of winning six world championships, which in itself is historic and an incredible, incredible achievement. I think, you know, people are so obsessed with Hamilton at least matching um, Michael Schumacher's seven that they didn't really give the opportunity for us to just sort of uh, digest what six winning six world championships feel like. And I think, you know, if Hamilton were to retire tomorrow, he's not a less of a racing driver because he never was able to actually match Michael Schumacher seven championships because, you know, um, circumstances are different and you never know next year, you never know what can happen. So I think we need to judge his six championships on its own merit and acknowledge what an historic and incredible achievement this is regardless of whether Michael Schumacher was able to win seven or not because that I feel is beside the point it was in a completely different era completely different type of car completely different skills and driving skills required so let's maybe hold off on too much of a comparison between the two and I think rather appreciate both of them in, you know when looking at both of their merits okay so let's maybe move on to um Valtteri Bottas who was the race winner and a, a bit of a forgotten race winner as I alluded maybe in my uh, opening uh, a national anthem parody you know obviously I think he was a bit you can see he was a bit annoyed at, at the end that or after the race that he was sort of brushed aside uh, unfortunately that's i guess just the reality of winning uh, someone winning six world championships and uh i guess i don't know you know he, he has to just make peace with it he, he drove very well and i think people did give him credit for how well he performed and i think it was an encouraging performance from him especially after suzuka um he had a very good qualifying session obviously as i mentioned he put both vettel and verstappen for pole in a very very hotly contested qualifying session and I think he's building a case for 2020. Now, I think it's plain to see that Bottas still isn't quite on Hamilton's level in race trim, especially. And I think just in terms of consistency, because there was, I think especially when the pressure started building a lot in terms of the championship campaign, Hamilton was arguably the better qualifier as well. And I think only now that Bottas has sort of made peace with the fact that the championship is done, I think it's freed him up a bit and he was able to get a bit closer to the qualifying performances he had at the beginning of the year. But I do think Bartas is getting closer and closer to Hamilton. And it's encouraging, I think. And it's good for Mercedes as well, since 
they're going to need both Hamilton and Bottas on their A game next year, I think, to be able to win another championship, given how strong Ferrari and Red Bull now over the last two weekends are coming on. So encouraging for Bottas, um, a good win. I think one of his best race victories to date. He was fast throughout, didn't seem to really struggle with tire degradation. So I think it's a positive for him. And uh, another Mercedes won two. So it's, they still seem to be the team that can just pull a result out of, out of the bag and that can win these sort of tightly contested races most consistently. And I think we can now safely say that they are still the favorites for the championships in 2020 despite Ferrari's a bit of a, you know, flick up flickering or whatever you can call it that they had after the summer break, I think Mercedes still is consistently the fastest team across the most racetracks. Ferrari might be faster here or there, Red Bull might be faster here or there, but across the 21 race calendar, I think Mercedes is still the team to beat. Now, for Red Bull, I think this is an encouraging race. Uh, they had a bit of a struggle since the summer break, you know, after Verstappen won in Austria so convincingly and then had a good showing in Silverstone and Verstappen won the wet race in uh, in Germany and then he got the pole position in Hungary and challenged Hamilton for the win there. I think most people thought that Red Bull was actually going to be the challengers to Mercedes for the remainder of the year and then all of a sudden when we came back after the summer break, it was Ferrari back on top and Red Bull sort of floundering um, between nothing or, you know, and, and anything else. So I think very much encouraging. And I think, um, if you, especially if you think about the fact that obviously Verstappen technically got pole in Mexico and he was less than a tenth off in, in Austin despite qualifying third. So, yeah, qualifying actually looks very encouraging for them, which would be a good news for Honda especially. Now, the race itself, I think, was a bit disappointing. I think they expected to be slightly stronger in race pace. Um, I don't think they quite had the pace to keep with Mercedes. However, it did you know, come to light after the race that Verstappen had a bit of front wing damage and it had some type of hole in his floor, so that might have affected his race performance uh, to an extent. But I think overall, after, you know, when you saw it was Bottas, and, and, and Hamilton in one and three and Verstappen in second, it was always going to be difficult for Red Bull to make it work given that Mercedes effectively had the upper hand in strategy and being able to split what they were going to do in terms of what race strategy they employ. So, um, yeah, slightly, I guess, disappointing outcome for Red Bull with Verstappen specifically, but I think it's a step in the right direction for the team um, despite the fact that they still have a lot of work to do before they can consistently challenge the Mercedes um, most pertinently probably on the engine side, but I think here and there on the chassis side as well. Now, um, Alex Albon, the other driver, had a bit of a, uh, an interesting one on race day. Um, he was, uh, of course, anointed the official driver of the day. And I think um, there's a good argument to be made for why he deserved to win driver of the day. He had three pit stops after he got sort of pincered in the first corner between uh, Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz. Um, he was then relegated to the back of the grid after his stop. And, um, you know, he made two more pit stops after that and then came back to finish in fifth place. I think he passed Sainz, Norris and Ricardo about a million times each. And uh, his race pace was actually very encouraging. I thought he was consistently very fast. You know, he does have the fast, the fastest race car amongst those those guys. But I think given how his how his race unraveled, it was probably a positive outcome for him to come fifth and was probably the maximum for him given his relative pace to the leaders. So now I think his job now is to improve qualifying in order to properly mix it with the boys going forward. I think we, sh we saw glimpses of it in, in Suzuka uh, during the Japanese Grand Prix and I think he did come out and say that on his one qualifying run in Q3 now he actually made quite a big mistake that cost him about three to four tenths. So I think he would have been right there with, with the top boys if he didn't make the mistake. And I really hope that he can keep on improving and keep on getting more comfortable with the car to have a topper, a topper, a proper six-way fight between the, the top teams um, come 2020. And I think that'll be absolutely fascinating to see. And given that, I also think that he's now a lock for the 2020 seat at Red Bull. Um, so I would be very, very surprised if Red Bull um, put someone else in that car. But, 
you never know. It's Helmut Marko's team after all. So sometimes he does very weird and interesting things. Talking about weird and interesting, I think Ferrari had definitely had one of those days um, where you can just look at what their Sunday and just go, what in the world happened there? It's been a um, it's been a tumultuous weekend for Ferrari. They had some reliability issues with Leclerc uh, with his engine in in free practice three, which then meant he he missed the the entire practice. Uh, I think he did come out and say that it affected him slightly in qualifying. You know, it took him a, just a bit of time to get his his head in the game and get his eye in into the racetrack again to really put a, a quick lap together. But I think the most interesting news over the weekend for Ferrari was this technical directive uh, issued by the FIA on the engine. So for a bit of context, and for those that have been following Formula One in general and this podcast, there's been a bit of a, a, a controversy, if you can call it that, around Ferrari's engine and how much more powerful it appears to be, especially in qualifying. Now, obviously, Mercedes and Red Bull and Basically, any non-Ferrari engine team were or are very upset about this apparent advantage that Ferrari has. And uh, Red Bull especially seems to be quite adamant that somewhere something is something is afoot and that Ferrari is doing something scaly behind the scenes. So they had a suspicion that um, they might be bending the rules with regards to the fuel flow so the, or the rate of fuel flow. Now... Just to get a bit technical quickly, there's effectively a rule for these engines that the rate that the fuel is allowed to flow through the engine and into the cylinders, there's there's effectively a cap to the speed that the fuel is allowed to flow uh, through the engine. And this is monitored by a sensor mandated by the FIA. Now, Red Bull has a suspicion that Ferrari is effectively finding a way to circumvent the sensor by tricking it to basically, and obviously the details, the technical details are still a bit vague, um, but they effectively go about tricking this fuel flow sensor to measure the fuel flow incorrectly and to effectively show that less fuel is flowing through the engine than what is actually going through. Now, the FIA issued a technical directive after this inquiry by Red Bull where they basically asked and said, listen, FIA or listen, Formula One, um, is this legal or not? Because if it is legal, then they as Red Bull would like to pursue this avenue as well. And obviously they came out and said, no, it's not because it's literally a direct infringement of the actual fuel flow rules. And then obviously they then issued this to all of the teams and said, listen, it's not allowed. Then people were obviously very interested to see what's going to happen to Ferrari's engine advantage. And lo and behold, actually the advantage that was about seven tenths, I think on the main straight in Japan was all of a sudden about two and a half tenths in Austin. Now, immediately people were suspicious in qualifying and said, no, but now look, they issued this technical directive and look what happened to Ferrari's qualifying pace and straight line performance and i think now some people and i think it's very important and it's mentioned on on other you know media sites before or before this that you know correlation does not necessarily mean causation so just because ferrari happened to be a bit slower on the straights during this race doesn't necessarily mean that the technical directive is the reason for that you know, it is a bit more of a downfall limited circuit in a way. So Ferrari did admit and say that they put on a lot more downforce between the Friday and the Saturday to improve their corner performance, which then meant obviously that a higher downforce and higher drag means slower straight line speed. And that's effectively what they said explains why Ferrari wasn't as fast on the straights. But now you get Max Verstappen, who immediately after the race in the press conference, or apologies, not in the press conference, but to the Dutch media came out and said, when they asked him whether he was surprised at how, you know, how much slower Ferrari was during the race, he came out and said, no, he wasn't surprised because that's what happens when you cheat. Now, Verstappen does have a bit of a big mouth because I think it's premature and a bit controversial for him to come out and say that they are blatantly cheating when nothing of this has been proven 
or that no official complaint or protest has been logged by any of the other teams over Ferrari's engine. So he might have gotten himself and his team in a bit of hot water there. And it was actually interesting. Mattia Bonato, um, Ferrari's team principal, was seen at the Red Bull motorhome after the race, after Verstappen made these comments, looking quite upset and having a heated conversation with Christian Horner. I think where he basically told Christian that he needs to control his drivers because they can't make unjustified allegations. And I very much agree with, with Bonato here. They've been very upfront about their innocence around the engine and that they keep saying that if the teams want to complain about the engine, they need to log an official protest and then let the FIA investigate. And they are very much of the belief that the FIA won't find anything wrong if they do investigate. But anyway, so that, that's enough on the engine. Let's talk about qualifying quickly. And, you know, it was still a close affair despite Ferrari's apparent lack in engine power where Vettel was a hundredth of the pace in qualifying. Leclerc was very close behind after missing the whole of FP3. Now, the race was an absolute disaster. Um, they couldn't seem to switch on the medium tires uh, at the beginning of the race, it seemed. Lewis Hamilton streaked past both of them uh, on the opening lap, which um, made them seem a bit ordinary. And Vettel, after that, got overtaken by Landon Norris and Daniel Ricciardo quite quickly which then meant that uh, he was running in seventh place by the time that his rear suspension completely disintegrated over a curb. That, uh, you know, ruined his race, obviously, and it meant he had to retire. But, but the pace that he was showing before the suspension actually broke, it wasn't all that encouraging for him regardless. So, um, yeah, I think people are wondering whether, you know, there was an inherent uh, flaw in the suspension by the time the race began, and that's effectively why he was so much slower than everybody else. And I think at least there's merit to that theory, but we'll never know. Or I guess Ferrari will maybe tell us uh, in two weeks' time whether this was actually the case. Now, that meant Charles Leclerc was the uh, lone Ferrari left running the race, and he was struggling to lap within a second of the leaders over that opening stint. And, um, you know, it was a horrible horrible first stint on on the medium tires and he came out afterwards as well and just said it was shockingly bad and yeah it was they were dropping back so quickly you couldn't believe it and you know they put it for the hard tires and um i guess it was slightly better their their pace relative to the the, the leaders but again ferrari was always always aiming to do a two stop with hamilton on a one stop and leclerc was still not hap- not lapping as quickly as lewis hamilton was um, on the hard tires, despite the fact that Hamilton was saving hard tires like a madman, trying to you know somehow make a one stop work during the race, so um, people people do say that I think uh, also the fact that Charles Leclerc was running an old engine due to his engine braking in FP3 it contributed to this this issues that they had in terms of their race pace, but I think. You know, the car was just slow. I think it was just a track similar to the Hungarian Grand Prix where it didn't suit their car, sort of was hidden in qualifying trim, but in the race situation, the tire degradation was too high, couldn't get the tires to work properly. And um, I think it shows that Ferrari, they've made progress over the year, but I think this race shows that they still have some progress to make in order to be fully competitive in all tracks similar to Red Bull and I guess similar to Mercedes. It's interesting now that I think each of the three teams have different strengths and weaknesses and whatever type of track and whoever nails the setup the best over the race is going to win. And it's not necessarily such a clear-cut thing with regards to who is going to come out on top in any given situation. Now, obviously, the midfield has just been competitive the whole year and it's been so wonderful to see the midfield battles and i think um if we can get the top three teams as competitive as we get the midfield is at the moment then we're going to be in for a massive treat in 2020 and hopefully in 2021 and thereafter as well so let's quickly run through our favorite formula 1.5 teams now renault actually had a pretty positive grand prix after not a great qualifying performance it wasn't terrible but it wasn't you know a brilliant outcome in qualifying for for Renault but you know Ricardo came home in sixth place in the race after making a very good one-stop 
work for him. Nico Hulkenberg uh, finished in ninth place, so a set of double points for Renault that was so difficult for them to come by um, or to achieve over the, you know, especially during the middle part of the season. So that'll be encouraging for them. And I think, especially in the race trim, they were actually very competitive and were probably the fastest uh, midfield car, which uh, is uh, interesting given that McLaren usually has that title to their name. Um, now, McLaren was quite promising as well. Or again, a good performance for them with Norris in 7th and Sainz in 8th. So and again, another double point scoring finish for them. Uh, I think if, if McLaren and Renault can maintain this trajectory that they're on, I would love to see the Renaults and the McLarens really, really go hammer and tongs next year fighting to get close to the top three teams and to compete with each other along the way. I think it will be really, really good racing and I think we can really set the championship alight in a completely different fashion. Now, I think obviously in this pairing, I think Daniel Ricciardo was probably the best performer here. He had a very good start. He was racy the whole race through. He made some great overtakes, late braking, typical Ricciardo fashion. So, yeah, I think him... I think Daniel Ricciardo was one of my candidates for driver of the day. And I think if Albon didn't win it, I think Ricciardo would have deserved to win to win that prize. Now, if you go a bit lower down, I think another candidate for, for driver of the day would have been Sergio Perez, who came in 10th. He started from the pit lane after a bit of a controversial Weybridge incident. I'm not going to go into it now. You can go read up on it if you want. But Perez missed the Weybridge in free practice two. And then he was punished by having to start from the pit lane for right from the back. Now, driving from the pit lane and to finish in 10th place is a very good achievement and a very Sergio Perez thing to do, given how good he is on the tires and given what, you know, the tire management for this race was going to always be quite important. So a very good drive by Sergio Perez with Lance Stroll coming home in 13th place. He had a bit of an anonymous race, so not really much I can say there. Um, Alfa Romeo, Kimi Raikkonen also had a very good race given the circumstances. Obviously, that car seems to struggle at the moment. Something's wrong with either pure performance or setup, or I don't know what the situation is, but yeah, the Alfa seems to struggle a bit. So for Raikkonen to finish in 11th, right off the points, is actually an encouraging performance. Now his teammate, Antonio Giovinazzi, um, came in 14th place, and it's just been announced that Giovinazzi is going to stay on at Alfa Romeo next year which is obviously then great news for him and great news for Italy but horrible news for Nico Hulkenberg and Nico Hulkenberg fans of which I am one I think it's a travesty that he is no longer in Formula One I think he was for so long he was the best of the rest in terms of you know after the top three teams he was always the one that was sort of mopping up the points uh, after the top three teams cleaned up. And for someone of his skill and his consistency, I think it's just very sad to see a driver of his capabilities to not be on the grid next year. But you never know, he might be back in 2021. I really do hope that he'll be able to be back, but I guess we'll see. Toro Rosso had a bit of a, a crazy race. They were actually surprisingly fast during the practice sessions, and I think they were... At one stage, I thought it was going to be between them and McLaren for best of the rest. Now, Pierre Gasly was actually very impressive, especially in qualifying. And he seemed to be doing well in the race as well. But uh, some late race incidents and tomfoolery amongst the, the midfield meant that Gasly actually ended up finishing in 16th with Daniel Kvyat almost scoring a point. But when he wanted to try and overtake Sergio Perez, he pulled one of his Banzai late break moves and uh, took off Perez's front wing. He then got a penalty for that, and he was very displeased after the race about about this penalty. The second race in a row, where he got a, a an immediate post race penalty after an, a late race incident. So Daniel Kvyat was not a happy bunny afterwards, and he came home in twelfth. Now Haas and Williams, I think we just lumped them together in their own little swimming pool of misery because it's just been such a wretched season for both of these teams Grosjean I think finished in 17th Kevin Magnussen had a, a spectacular brake failure right into you know after the long straight Williams uh, had to 
retire Kubica with hydraulics failure and George Russell came home in 17th, two laps down. So not much to say there except I really do hope these two teams can can go come back next year and, and compete better because I'm starting to worry for someone like George Russell because he's such a talented driver. He was last year's Formula 2 champion. He beat Landon Norris, he beat Alex Albon and he's just floundering at the back of the grid, not really able to show his capabilities because it's in a car that's so much worse than everything else. It's just very frustrating to see. All right, let's move on to the TF1 awards for the United States Grand Prix. The Pasta Maldonado Award for Most Dunderheaded Deed is a tie between Max Verstappen making serious unsubstantiated claims and Daniel Kvyat making ridiculous attempts at passing and then throwing all of his toys when the stewards rightfully give him a penalty. The Lewis Hamilton Hashtag Blessed Award goes to all of the drivers on a one-stop strategy that was about to be overtaken two laps before the end of the race and I'm looking at you Lewis Hamilton and Daniel Ricciardo their bacon was saved by a rampaging Haas with exploding brakes and the double waved yellows at the ideal overtaking spot on the track effectively brought all of Max Verstappen and Lando Norris's progress to a shuddering halt. The Nico Hulkenberg Award for Unluckiest Driver has to go to poor Valtteri Bottas for producing an excellent race performance against his six-time world champion teammate only to be completely overshadowed by the championship celebrations and for everyone forgetting about him point blank. At least for this award, Valtteri, you'll get the appropriate amount of pomp and circumstance. Congratulations to the winners and may this day stick in your memories for the rest of time. Now, ladies and gents, can you believe it? We only have two races to go before the end of the 2019 F1 season, and I can safely say that we still have many questions mulling about in our minds. Will Christian Horner finally relent and buy Max Verstappen a Red Bull branded muzzle before press conferences? Will Mattia Bonotto finally come clean after attempting to fool the entire Formula 1 paddock and admit that he's actually Harry Potter's Italian bushy head uncle? Will any of us ever recover after listening to Dan Ricciardo's Australian version of an American accent? And lastly, will Ferrari's engines be back at full speed in Brazil? As always, much to ponder. And that's it for another episode of the TF1 show. I hope you enjoyed it despite the slight delay and despite the average rendition of the United States National Anthem. To conclude, I will now move on to the obligatory begging segment of the show where I beg you to leave a review or a comment or if you really are feeling friendly, to hit the subscribe button. I will then proceed to beg you to follow me on Twitter where my handle is at the TF1 show for my absolutely gripping takes on the world of F1 or to follow me on Instagram where my handle is at the TF1 show for my absolutely gripping takes of pictures. Looking forward to the next week where I'll be back with another episode, this time back to my normal Monday slot. Bye.